Let's take our Bibles tonight and stand and turn to 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4 tonight, of course, the teenagers will be down uh, eating pizza and uh, volleyball. And, you know, because of kind of the repositioning, we don't get to talk about it very much. We have a great coffee shop, great place for fellowship. And if some of you are like, man, what, what do we do tonight while the kids are down there? Go up to the coffee shop, get some coffee and sit around and hang out, have some fellowship. That's one of the things I'm honestly looking forward to about moving back to the auditorium is and we had some great nights out there just hanging out and fellowshipping. And then when we get the babies and little ones up to that 100 building and just that kind of that area, it's just going to be great. And uh, so excited about that. But go on up there tonight, get yourself a little something to drink. And we try to make the prices not, you know, like what's out there, but just enough to cover costs. And so it doesn't break the piggy bank, you know, uh, to go. And especially nowadays, you know. And everything's just skyrocketing, and so it's nice to be able to just get a little coffee or something and, and not feel like you have to take a loan uh, to do that, amen? And so anyway, First Kings. Let's do this. First Kings, let's look at just, we're just going to read two verses, and then I'm going, to cover, I'm going to cover about 20 verses in the message tonight, but I just want to read a couple. So look at First Kings 3, look at verse 28. Well, look at verse 27. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. So King Solomon was king over all Israel. I want to preach on this subject with the Lord's help tonight. A little, just kind of a practical, just some thoughts and some points tonight. I want to preach on this subject. Wisdom for beyond Jerusalem. Wisdom for beyond Jerusalem. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. And so thankful, God, for the blood of Christ. Thankful that it cleanses every stain. Pray, bless now the preaching of your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. All of God's people said... Amen. You may be seated tonight. Solomon had been told by God in a dream, after making the request in the dream, that God would make him the wisest man who had ever lived, that none would be wiser before him and none would be wiser after him. And while Solomon believed that by faith and worshipped God by faith, it still had to be demonstrated, it had to be proven there at the judgment seat as he would deal with various cases. And it didn't take long for an impossible situation to be brought before him as these two harlots came before him and each claiming that this one baby was their, that the living baby was each their own and that the baby that had passed was the others. There was no real way to differentiate in the character between the two. There were no witnesses to speak to the two. In all reality, there was not enough information or data for any person to really understand or know whose baby that child was. But Solomon had the knowledge and the wisdom to do something I don't think any of us would have thought of, to call for a sword. And in calling for that sword, he, he made the proposition that neither mother would get the child, but that they would split the baby in half and give each piece to the mothers. And in that, in that decree, the revelation came forth as the proper mother cried out and said, no, give her the child. Uh, I, I will give up this ride. And thus Solomon knew and identified who the true mother was. And for all standing in there, they came to the conclusion of verse 28 that they heard the judgment of the king had judged and they feared the king for they saw the wisdom of God in him. In that moment, they realized that God had delivered, that God had done as he said, that Solomon, now think about this, Solomon had been given a wisdom unlike any person who'd lived before him and outside of Christ, any man that would live after him. And so he has this, this incredible wisdom. I mean, a wisdom that you and I could never understand and never could fathom. And so, and so as he does that, I want you to think about as we then lean into verse 1, 
the Bible says this, so King, Sol- or so King Solomon was king over all Israel. Now remember this, when we go back, remember what Solomon's concern was. Solomon's concern was not for just one or two of the judgments that he was faced, but if you go back and read, and if you remember, that Solomon's concern in being put as king was this, he said that God had given him such a great people as, as a number that could be not counted, and how could he lead and guide and navigate this massive nation as the king? And so now here is Solomon, and he's given this great wisdom, and now he looks out if from Jerusalem, but he realizes that he now has the responsibility of ruling and guiding and navigating not just Jerusalem, but the entire nation of Israel. He's not just responsible for the southern tribes or the northern tribes. He's responsible for the entire nation. And so here's the question. How does a man who has been given more wisdom than any other approach this situation? How does a man who, if you put Solomon in the room, you know who the smartest man in the room is? When you add Solomon to the room, you know that though there are great people around him, Solomon carries within himself more wisdom than any other. How does this this man given divine wisdom go about and approach running, guiding, and navigating this massive nation of people? And here's what we're going to see. That Solomon would use his wisdom to create a structure with policies and leaders to govern the nation. He would would create, he would literally design a new structure for the people of Israel, for the nations of Israel, and within that structure, he would position leaders to help govern and help achieve the guidance and the ruling of the nation. Now, here's what I want you to get. That Solomon did not use his supernatural wisdom to do everything. He used it to delegate well. A man who had wisdom for all situations, for all problems, a man who could come up with the solution rising above anyone else in the room, that that man did not use the wisdom to say, all right, I'm going to roll up my sleeves with this divine wisdom and I'm going to tackle the nation of Israel. He used that same divine wisdom to say, no, we need to create a structure and we need to put leaders in place so that we can navigate this nation properly. He looks at his work, he looks at the country, and he says, I've got to get people into place. You know, highly skilled, I'm going to go at this from a personal standpoint, from a church standpoint. Highly skilled people have a tendency to hold on to too much work. People who are good at things. They've they've developed their craft they, they have a lot of care. They really emotionally are attached to their work or to their passion. People who, who have invested and poured their heart into things and, and, and go home at night and they think about the results of how things are going to go. People who have over time developed and nurtured their areas or their departments have a tendency to hold on to more things than they should. But one of the things that we learn about Solomon is this is that wise people invest more time into delegation than they do into doing all of the work themselves. When Israel expands, the load grows for Solomon. And so rather than spending all of his time solving all the problems, working with all the tribes, he spends his time positioning and overseeing leaders to help the nation operate properly. Why? Because no man is able to properly oversee Israel-sized loads. Because Solomon had enough wisdom to know that with all of his wisdom, with all of his knowledge, with all of his care, with all of his concern, that he would fail in areas throughout the nation that no man can govern an Israel-sized load. 
I want to say this. Think about this. We're going to see the wisest man delegate responsibility to other men who just by the definition, they're not as wise as him. Which there's a lesson for us is this. Be, listen, you may be the most skilled, but someone else can still do that job. No, no, you may be. Now, sometimes we think we are and we're not, but you may actually be the most skilled at something. But you know what we're going to see? That even though Solomon was the wisest person in the nation, he still was able to find people who could get the job done. And you might be very skilled. You might be very talented. You might be very intuitive. You might have the capacity to lead or to manage or to grow or to develop. When you put your hands on it, you may be the best person at that thing. But mark this down. There are other people who can do that job too. As a church, as we grow or as a church changes, just as Solomon, listen, when you follow the structure from Saul to David to Solomon, the structure of organization, leadership, and communication changes from king to king to king. It, it, it morphs, it evolves, it takes different shapes. And in a local church, as we grow, as we change, as we go through different dynamics and different things come and go, you know what was going to happen? Our church structure, our church policies, our church methods of communication and doing things will also change. Which means this... To be, a part of a, to be a part of a church, if it is functioning with wisdom, means this, with changes in structure and changes in policy and, and movements in leadership. Here's what it means. We have to be flexible. It means this, that if just because we always filled out this piece of paper and we always put this piece of paper here and it always went to this person, it means this, oh, that we might change it and we might have to be okay with it. It means that there might have to be different people over here and different people over there, and we might have to move some departments around and have different overseers in different ways. And if that's the case, here's what it means for us as a church. We have to be flexible with the movements and the adjustments and the changes that are needed to move a church forward. Now listen to this very carefully. Wisdom says, for a church to be properly run... Others must be appointed by the pastor and accepted by the church. There's two things here. First of all, a pastor cannot feel compelled to address everything important in the church. Different pastors have a tendency to hold on to things for different reasons. Sometimes a pastor will just naturally, maybe if, if, if the pastor started the church and, and was used to doing everything, many of you know a lot of times you start off with something, you're doing everything, and as something grows, sometimes it can be hard uh, to hand things off. Sometimes pastors struggle with this. They don't want to overwork people. They're, they're, always, they're always hesitant. They're always nervous about putting too much on people, and so sometimes they, they keep too much for themselves because they're afraid of overworking others. But, but pastors and spiritual leaders have to appoint people to do ministry work. Amen. But you know, sometimes people only want the pastor to do that work. They don't want to talk to an officer or a staff member or a leader. They only want to talk to the pastor. And it's not going to help much if a pastor delegates responsibility, but then everybody under those delegated responsibilities still has to talk to the pastor about it. Hey, I'm preaching here first, and I'm preaching out this way next. Amen. A church must have both. A pastor and leaders who are willing to anoint and appoint people, but then also people who are willing to follow that appointed or that anointed leadership. Also, listen, churches that fail to delegate will stagnate. Because if a church is healthy, it's growing. If a church is healthy, there's new people. And here's what that means. That, that, there, that, that as we become more Israel-like in the load, here's what it means. There's going to have to be more officers working to help navigate that load. I love that. I love that Solomon and all of that wisdom. He looks at it and says, okay, we need to spread this out. 
and we need to delegate. And listen to me, you might be buried right now. You might have an Israel-like load and, you're, and you've, tried, you've, you've done your schedule 4,000 different ways. You, you've tried getting up at 5 a.m. and staying up to 3 a.m. I mean, you've, you've tried cutting meetings down and lunch breaks down. You feel like no matter how you cut it, you can't get everything done. Here's what that means. It means you've got too much. And you've got to figure out a way to create a structure to get some things off of you so that things can run how the Lord would have them to run in your life. So Solomon is going to approach this structure from two phases. First of all, he's going to deal with the people within his palace. He's going to deal with, we'll say this way, his cabinet. And that's what the Bible says in verse 2. It says, these were the princes that he had. Now, when you and I hear the word princes, we think of, right, king, prince. We think of the son of a king. And that, you know, he's, he's related and thus he's next in line. Princes can also be used in a similar way. When you have a prince, think of it this way. A prince is second in command to the king, right? And so the idea of princes in, 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 a, in, a, in a lineage form, it would be, hey, all of these different sons of the king, right? They, they are in line. They are second in command. Well, this is the same concept, but without the lineage. These are people that have been appointed to work under the king to get different jobs done. And so I just want to take us through these, these different appointments. I'm not going to preach on them, but I want to just help us get the picture because I want to draw some points from this. First of all, I want you to notice verse 2. It says this, And these were the princes which he had, Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest. Now I also want you to notice verse 4. It says, And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host, and Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. So here's, when you put this together, here's what you find out, that there's a changing of the guard here. Zadok is Azariah's grandfather, and, and as we saw earlier in the scripture, Zadok ended up, uh, uh, through the transition of Solomon becoming the king, Zadok became the high priest. Abiathar was put out of the priesthood, but I love, I love the grace of God here. That even though Abiathar had been put out of the priesthood, you know what the word of God doesn't slam him, doesn't slide him, still recognizes all those decades of service, still recognizes all those years of service, and points out that as Zadok and Abiathar are passing on the scene, that Azariah now, the grandson of Zadok, is now going to become the high priest. So the very first thing it says is, Azariah is going to now lead the priest. He is the high priest. Then you have verse 3. Uh, Eli Horef and Ahia and the sons of Shisha, scribes, Jehoshaphat, the sons of Alihud, uh, uh, Ahilud, the recorder. So you have two men here who are described as scribes. Now, the concept of a scribe was this. They were the men who handled the king's correspondence. So as the king would have want to get information or get messengers, messages out to various kings and various nations and various leaders, he had these two men that were scribes. It's more than likely that these two different men represented two different languages and that they could write to different people groups. And so he would go to these scribes and he would, he would articulate messages that he wanted and these men were responsible for transcribing those and then getting those messages delivered and spoken to the various leaders that would need to be told. And then they would be responsible to get messages back and inform the king. The Bible talks about Jehoshaphat as the recorder. The recorder here means basically like a policy officer. This wasn't like he just records things that are being said. It would be where King Solomon would say, here is, an, here is a law or here is a policy that I want to initiate uh, nationwide or into the, pla the place of Jerusalem. And what Jehoshaphat would do is he would write that policy down and then he would be responsible to, to communicate that to the various heads of, of whether it's provinces or areas and he would give that information and communicate these policies or these policy adjustments that came from the king. Then in verse 4, one of my favorite men, you have Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host. I love Benaiah because you, you first read about him all the way back when David is in the cave. And he's one of David's mighty men. And now here he is silently having been faithful. Now here he is as the top general leading over all of Solomon's army, which at this point was probably the peak of the, the army of Israel above any other time in his history. And so here's this mighty man with all of his wisdom and all of his battle knowledge and all of his understanding being placed to oversee 
uh, all of the other generals and all the other captains and all the leaders. Then you have verse 5. The Bible says, And Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers. Now, what we're going to see in verse 7 later on is that, is that Solomon is going to appoint different officers um, by region to span throughout the entire nation of Israel for a particular purpose. And Azariah's job was to oversee each of those officers to make sure they understood what their job was, to be able to communicate with any problems that they might have, to keep them accountable, to keep them helped. And he would be able to report to the king concerning to the status of every district. Then you have verse 5. The Bible says, um, Zabad, the son of Nathan. And so you have two sons of Nathan. The principal officer, what a great phrase, and the king's friend. I love Solomon's wisdom here. He's, he, listen, Solomon's not so bent on doing everything his own way that he disregards the people of the past. Some guys, sometimes men are insecure and they got to do everything their way and they got to start fresh and they don't want to bring in the past or recognize the past. I mean, he's got Benaiah from the past, his father's man, leading the king. And now he's got two of Nathan. Remember, Nathan's the prophet who preached uh, to David and, and was, was close to David. And he's got two of Nathan's sons that he's using. And he uses Zebud. And look at the humility of this as his principal officer. Here's what that is. That's his advisor. And because he's his advisor, he, he's his close friend. He's what, he's what like Hushai was. He's like what Ahithophel was to David. He, he is an advisor. And I love the fact that here is this man who God has told he's going to have the greatest wisdom of anyone. But you know what? He still made sure he still had advisors around him. And, and a man who's very close to him. Just as Nathan had helped just as Nathan had helped his father, now Nathan's sons are helping him. Then you have in verse 6, Ahishar was over the household. So, so you have Solomon and he has a palace. And as we start going through kings, it's quite a palace. And, and it's quite an estate. And if you read Ecclesiastes, you understand that part of his estate, you're talking gardens, you're talking about vineyards, you're talking about buildings, you're talking about art, you're talking about you know, all of these different things going on, not to mention all of the workers. Ahashar was in charge of all those things, leading those things, managing all those people and all of those areas of the property, scheduling. You know, I could just imagine every day Solomon's coming and saying, all right, hey, we're going to do this over here. I, that, I don't want that job, man, because his palace, you read Ecclesiastes, his, job, his palace was just going crazy all the time. And he was overseeing that, operating that, making sure everything was taking place. Then you had Adoniram, the son of Abda, who was over the tribute. Look, you, 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 can't, you can't run a country, you can't have an army, you, you can't have buildings, you can't have the temple, you can't have any of these things without, without taxes, without finances. And so now he puts, uh, now he puts Adoniram over there. And so, so he has to go out, and here's what he has to do. He has to discern, first of all, what can they tax and where? You can't just tax people you know, money that they don't have, and then making sure that that money is being gathered and making sure that that money is being brought in and that it's being spent accurately. And now you have to understand there's no corruption from the getting of the taxes to the delivering of the taxes. And he would be overseeing all of those things, protection from theft and corruption and, and running just the financial aspect of handling the taxes. And all of these different men were selected by Solomon to handle all of these different things. Can you see all of these things going on? you got high priests, and you have courses, and you have Levites, and you have all this stuff going at the tabernacle, and eventually at the temple. And then you have Benaiah, and he's over the generals, and the captains, and the army, and the training of the army. And then you have men talking about the taxes, and the numbers, and what's coming in, and how's it impacting the economy of people, and making sure that it's going through the proper hands, and the proper channels. You have another man there at the palace, and he's making sure that things are being tended to, and taken care of, and that the servants are being paid and that, that different men are being promoted and that there's no corruption or strife happening between all of them. And then you have Solomon there in the back and, and he's, got, he's got his advisor with him and he's talking about different options and different things and this man is going to give advice to the wisest man on the planet and they're engaging. I mean, you've got all this stuff going on just in the palace. There's just some thoughts that I have of that as I thought about. First of all, there are usually more things that can be delegated than we realize. 
Look, if, if when, you feel, when you feel cumbered about, when you feel like you've got so much going on, you know what you're going to find? That you probably can get more off to other people than you realize. I think about every one of those responsibilities, it would be hard to discern which ones are not important. Taxes, military, I mean, on and on. We, I mean, all of these things, the priesthood, but you know, Solomon entrusted these men to handle those massively important things, which means this, there are people who are capable of doing critical work. Critical work. Significant work. Like, this can't fall apart kind of work. God had people for him that could do those kinds of things. I wrote this. A lot of people have no problem telling the pastor to delegate while at the same time being unwilling to take on a duty. (laughs) Oh, preacher. Just need to spread the wealth. Just need to... Just get the load off. If there's anything you need, let me know. Oh, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. No, it, it's, it's easy to look at a leader and just say, oh, well, that leader ought to delegate more. They just ought to get more off their shoulders. But you better make sure that if you're going to make that statement that you're willing to take something on your shoulders. Because, because, because there are many people that walk into a church and walk into somewhere and say, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what, they just need to, they just need to spread the wealth. And then the sign-up sheets go out and the clipboards go out and they're, they're magically their name is never on the clipboard. A wide range of skills are necessary for a thriving church. It's not just a message. It's not just a Sunday school lesson. Do you know how many things take place for a church to function and thrive? Whether it's whether it's construction, whether it's finances, I mean whether whether it's decor, whether it's visiting people and caring for people, whether it's making a meal for someone or I mean there are there are hundreds of things that take place around this church and there's honestly hundreds of more things that could take place around this church for a church to thrive there is room can I say it this way there's room for your skill set there's room for your skill set because for for a church for a for a church to thrive your skill set is needed And so Solomon, within the palace, he's got all this stuff going on. But now, now remember, but Solomon is not just over what's happening right around Jerusalem. Solomon is responsible for the entire nation. And over the nation, you would have the tribes, and of course you would have the elders that would report to him and he would talk to them. But Solomon understood that he was about to try to take the nation to a place it had never been. He was going to attempt to build a temple and buildings and all kinds of other things in the city on a scale that it had never been done before. And he understood this, that it was going to require an increase in finances. It was going to require not just a few people, but the whole nation working together to make it happen. And that's why you see this in verse 7. And Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king and his household, each man his month in a year made provision. So here's what happens. I don't have time to do this. I almost put a map up for you that Solomon is going to list these names of people, and basically he drew out these different regions. Now, when we read 12, here's what we think. It's 12 tribes of Israel. It's not. Levi Levi doesn't have an allotment. Ephraim and Manasseh aren't part of this. But he does 12, obviously, because it's consistent and it's a number that that has spiritual significance. And so he divides divides the land of Israel into 12 regions. And here's what he does. He doesn't go to the tribal leader. He puts his own guys in each region and they are responsible to go to each of those regions to collect taxes so that they can get the job done all for the nation to be taken care of. So what would happen? I I wouldn't want that job. The officer comes from Jerusalem, goes to every region and make sure that the officers that are over, or the, the, he puts the officers over every region, and those officers are responsible to make sure that that region is paying their taxes so that the money can go back so that all of the work can be taken care of. And so Solomon, get this, Solomon 
is working throughout the nation. He, he is, his, his vision and his ideas are being transposed all over the nation. But how is it being accomplished? By officers placed in every region. A couple things I want to mention about that. You'll see this all through the Bible. God works through centralized leadership, not tribal leadership. What do you mean? Here's what I mean. That God doesn't work with a group of people, with this group over here, this group over here, this group over here, this group over here, this, and everyone does what they want to do. There's only one time you see that. Anyone know what book of the Bible that is? Judges. And it's not a good thing. Wherever God is leading, wherever God is working, understand this. He always works through the leadership, and then it flows out to every group and every person and every tribe or every area. God always speaks through his leadership, his spiritual leaders, and then from that, it is delegated, it is channeled out, and they all work together. Why do I say that? Because some people think delegation means give you what you want to do and do things your way with your vision and your own ideas. That's not delegation. That's not how things get done. If you take a church and you start passing off everything and you say do what you want and do what you want, you don't have one church, you have 400 churches. What, you, what you're supposed to have is the Holy Ghost is supposed to be leading our church and putting the proper leaders in and then we work through the vision and the concepts and the policies and what we're trying to do and then we all function as a team getting the mission accomplished. It also means this, God's people must be okay working through officers. Look, if those 12 officers showed up in those regions and they couldn't get what they needed, it wasn't going to work. It means this, listen, please hear me, no leader can meet everyone's needs. Is that okay to say? No leader can do that. And thus, there must be leaders who help represent the leader to get things done. And we have to be okay with going to different people so that the ministries can be achieved. Everyone must give for a team to thrive. You know, Jerusalem didn't fund this operation. All of Israel funded this operation. And if we as a church, if we're going to work, it can't just be a select few. It can't just be the faithful few. It can't just be a handful of committed people. It's got to be the whole church. It's got to be everybody. It's got to be, it's got to be every section and every corner of our church all pulling together, all working together, serving and giving in order for us to get the, to get the vision of God accomplished. So, so Solomon gets the structure, he gets the people in place. Now, now I would imagine, I would imagine that maybe some people in Israel at first struggled with this a little bit. Like, oh, wait, well, we got this officer here, we got this guy here, we put this guy in place. I could see there could be some tension, there could be some struggling. And you know what the fear always is in delegated leadership? Here's what it is, that someone's going to be neglected. But I want you to see what happens here in verse 20. Judah and Israel were many. As the sand which is by the sea, a multitude. In other words, this is a massive nation. Matter of fact, at this point, Israel finally occupies God's full map that he gives to Abraham. At this point, the entire map that they'd been praying from Joshua all the way through was fully occupied by them. And it is Judah in the south is packed and Israel to the north is packed. And notice, notice the picture and they are all both eating and drinking and making merry. What's the picture? Everybody has what they need. Everybody's able to eat. Not just the people in Jerusalem. Not just the people around Judea. All the way at the very northern tip of Israel. Far, far away from the king. You know what they're doing? They're eating just like the place in Jerusalem. And they're happy. And they're celebrating. And they're joyful. And listen... Everyone is taken care of. And here's, here's what verse 20 wants you to me to know. That Solomon's choice to invest in structure and delegation was the right one. Because he chose to structure and delegate, he was able to make sure that there was balance and care for all of Israel not just certain pockets of Israel. 
You know, that reminds me so much of in Acts chapter 6. Remember the account where the Bible says that there was a murmuring among the disciples because, uh, because the Grecians, their widows weren't being taken care of like the Hebrews' widows were being taken care of. And they're coming to the apostles and they're saying, look, you know, here we are and we have widows that aren't being fed. We have widows that aren't being taken care of. You know what the apostles' answer was? The apostles' answer is, look, we're, we can't leave preaching and prayer. So here's what we need to do. We need to appoint out of you more people to help meet the needs of the Grecian widows. And so what did they do? They created a structure and they created a rotation and they added more workers. And I believe those, by the way, I believe those were the first deacons, but they brought them in. And you know what happened? The Bible says that they were all taken care of and the church grew and multiplied. Delegation, our fear is that delegation will lead to some kind of neglect or second class citizen treatment, but here's the truth, delegation allows for balanced care and joy. Delegation ensures that all of the areas of our church and people of our church are being cared for, intended to, and given attention, and that there's proper oversight, and that, and that a pastor or a leader is not buried, so buried over here, he can't see what's going on over here, but he's able to pull back and be able to see the whole spectrum and be able to make sure that everybody's being taken care of. When there isn't delegation, people will get neglected. Others will tend to get more. Usually here's what happened. More demanding people will get more and the less demanding people won't get any. And leaders are unhappy because they're wore out and they're tired. But when there is delegation, guess what? Everyone can eat and drink and be merry. Another thing I want to point out, this is so powerful. Leaders need to get this because leaders miss this part. The goal of delegation isn't to benefit the leader. It's to bless the congregation. See, can, can I just pause and can I, give a little, can I give a little caveat to what some people think delegation is? This is not delegation. If this is what you think delegation is, you're wrong. Delegation is not, hey, you take your responsibility and pass it off to a bunch of people so you can go do nothing. Delegation is, in, oh, okay, I'm going to give this off and I'm going to watch everyone work and I'm not going to be involved in the grind. That is not delegation. Delegation is not about you and me making our life better and us relieving ourselves from work so we make everyone else work while we sit on some padded throne or something like that. Delegation is this. We recognize that we need everyone in every area to be benefited and to be blessed. And by getting more people involved, we can bless the entire congregation, not just a handful or a select few. Hey, look, if you go to your work or you think delegation is you've just passed something off to someone and you don't work in it, look, that, that, that will lead to so much frustration and, and it will discourage people and they won't want delegation from you. Here's the statement. Our wisdom isn't always for us to do something. It's often for us to delegate to someone. Our wisdom... What we know and what we're trying to do. It's not always for us to go do something. It's often for us to delegate to someone. Um, you know, I'm excited about our church. You know, I was just re rehearsing in my mind kind of just the last couple years and, and year and a half or whatever it is and you know, you come, and, and I think step one is, and I said this actually the, the Sunday night that I candidated, I said, you know what, I want vision. Well, vision is really contingent on what Lighthouse is. And so kind of the beginning, it's just like, well, what are we? I'm new. I'm the new guy. Who, who is Lighthouse? You know, I show up, and, and we sit in the staff meeting, and they're like, this person does this, this. And I'm like, I don't know who any of these people are. Who is Lighthouse? What is Lighthouse? Just understanding and familiarizing myself and just trying to know who the people of our church is and how we function and what we do and what we love and what we're good at and, and areas. We, and that takes time. That takes time just to get to know some people and just to get comfortable and to not feel, you know, like you're the new person and all those different things. And then, you know, we kind of start moving in. And, you know, our church, we've been through some stuff this year. You know, I mean, you, you know, some of you may not think back. I think all the way back starting with the preschool. And, and, I mean, there has been so many dynamics and challenges and things that we've had to work through in a very, it's like, it's like, I remember, I'll tell you a funny story. I'll, 
Um, I remember, I think I was in fifth or grade or fourth grade, and I grew up in a neighborhood where any time there was a conflict, you just fight it out. And I don't think that's great, but that's where I grew up. And there was a, there was a short guy named Gino that lived in our apartments, and, and uh, we were kind of exchanging some conversation and encouraging one another. And so it kind of led into a, we're about to, you know, we're about to duke it out. You know what I mean? And he's a short guy, so I thought, it's over. Like, so I wasn't really worried. You know what I mean? I thought, this is going to be pretty quick, and then we're going to go play basketball. Man, Gino, I didn't know, was a boxer. <laughs> no, like a real boxer. Like, ever since he's a little kid, he's in a little boxing stuff. Gino, before I even had a chance to make a move, had my nose wrung. <laughs> you know what happens when you get hit in the nose? Your eyes water. You get all dizzy. You're disoriented. And I'm seeing 18 Genos. <laughs> I'm good. I'm done. It's been a good day. Gino, you win today. God bless you. You know what I feel a little bit like happened to us a little bit this year? I think Gino had a little hit at us this year. Yeah. And, and, it, and it wasn't so much always about having this vision and this idea and that concept. You know what some of it was? Just trying to get orient, orientated. No, look, you, if you would have been, I think it was October 6th, if you would have walked into that auditorium on that Saturday night, at whatever it was, 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and you had been in there, and it looked like someone literally had hoses just pouring into our auditorium, and you're watching tiles fall all over the place. After a whole lot of other stuff that I won't even get into that we'd been through, I just remember standing there looking at this thinking, I don't even know what to do. I don't even know what to say this. And we're down here putting the folding chairs. You remember what this used to look like? Yeah, yeah you do remember. <laughs> And all the ovens over here and the little black curtain over here. I don't even know what was buried in the depths of this back thing. And we're about to have church in this thing. Basketball court was in the back corner. Come on. Ah, that's just getting punched in the nose. You know, you know what happens when you get punched in the nose? You're just trying to get your bearings. And that's, I feel like a lot of things we've been trying to do this past year have really been that. And let me just stop and say this. And so, look, if something's been dropped, if something's been forgotten, if something's been committed, or if something's been said, and we haven't followed through, followed through on it, first of all, I want you to know we're sorry for that. We never want to fail you. We never want to forget. We never want to miss stuff. But I'm just going to tell you, after some of that kind of stuff, I guarantee we've forgotten, missed some stuff, not followed through. There's some stuff that hasn't happened that... That probably, if the 14 other things didn't happen, probably would have happened. No, I remember telling my wife, I remember telling my wife, I'd stand at the double doors, and I'm, in, and I'm just so used to in Sri Lanka, I'd say, hey, I'm going to come see you this week, or I'm going to come see you this week, and I'd just go out and I can go see people. Well, I started, you know, I'd do that here, and then I realized I'd come in the office Monday, and I realized all the stuff that's going on. I'm like, I don't even know if I'm going to see the light of day this week. No, that's truth. And so what happens? You, you forget stuff. You lose stuff. You miss stuff. But by the way, you know what God did through all that? God blessed. Amen. Amen. It still was amazing. We had great church services. Amen. People still getting saved. People still joined the church. You know, people couldn't walk in and say, boy, this place looks like it's been hit in the nose. Nobody could discern that. Amen. But the reality is there were times we'd go back in the office and I'm thinking, man, I'm about to have some panic attacks back in here. This is, there's just too much going on. That's just reality. Praise God for his grace. Amen. Praise, Amen. praise God for his goodness. Just step by step, day by day, reminding us, you know what, we need him. Just we need him. What about this? What about this? Honestly, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. Now, I, I, I know that I want to see this ministry. I know I want to see that happen, but I'm just going to be honest. I'm just trying to get through Friday. I'm just trying to figure out where the money's coming from and, and what bills we have and all this other stuff. We're just trying to, like, get some ABCs and one, two, threes taken care of. God's got us through all that stuff. Amen. And you know what I see right now? Here's what I see. I feel like, I feel like God's blessed this lower worship center. It's, as a matter of fact, we had a guest come today, and I was telling him about the auditorium. He's like, you have another auditorium? Amen. He's like, this is really nice. So I was like, to God be the glory. Because he wouldn't have said that a year ago. <laughs> I feel like God's beginning to settle, settle the waters a little bit. And here's what I see. Can I tell you what I see? I see princes. I'm going to say it. it's going to sound corny, but I'm going to say it. I see princesses. Amen. What do you mean? I see leaders. 
I see, I see God knitting us through all this stuff we've been through. Forging us, bringing us together, getting us through all the mayhem. Forging us, knitting us. Why? For what he has for us next. But you know how we're going to get there? Here's how we're going to get there. We're not going to get there by Pastor Hetzer visiting everyone, talking to everyone, getting, leading every single ministry. You know what we're going to have to have? We're going to have to have captains. Now, we understand this at the Lighthouse. That's not a foreign concept to the Lighthouse. We have to have leadership. I believe that we have that leadership. I believe God's continuing to add people that are coming to the forefront. And I'm super excited I'm super, I was telling Amy, we're getting ready. We're going to hop in a car tomorrow. We're going to go on a road trip and we're going to spend a couple weeks away. And uh, Pastor Shirley is going to be preaching next Sunday. So for sure, it's going to be on. And uh, we'll be back for Father's Day. We're going to hear Pastor Fisher Father's Day night. So you're going to want to be here for that. Amen. And uh, so, so it's going to be good. But, you know, I was thinking, I was like, you know, if, if this, is, I feel like, man, if we had tried to get in the car three weeks ago, I'm not sure I'd have been wanting to get in the car and go. But as I'm beginning to see God position people Amen. and rise people up and use people and things are beginning to come in formation, I thought, I think it's about, I think it's about time to get away for a couple of weeks. I think church will be just fine. Amen. 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 And we're going to continue to work and we're going to continue to do the structure. I'm going to say this, and part of the structure is going to be this, so that we don't fail you. Amen. So that we don't miss something important. Amen. We're going to try to be more disciplined. I'm going to try to be more disciplined. To not, to, you know, sometimes I just want to do stuff for you and I want to meet you or I want to have, and it's just easy sometimes to say it because I was from a world where I could say it and do it that week. I'm not in that world right now. So I'm going to try to be more disciplined about that. But, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try to structure this in a way where we can eat and drink and live in joy of the Holy Ghost. And we can go up to the auditorium and we can see the power of God and the might of God and the glory of God. There's three things tonight I think that this message encourages us to do. First, we need to enlist leadership. We need to constantly get people in and get people serving and get people leading and giving people areas and, 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 and assisting others and helping others. We have a lot of areas where we need to enlist people from the babies and the kids and, and all the way through. It also means this, though, as we're enlisting leadership as a church, we have to accept leadership. It doesn't do us much good to enlist leadership and then not accept it. But thirdly, it means we have to be available for leadership. Because we might just come to you one time and say, hey, what do you think about this? We might start putting out some events and some things with some clipboards. And we might say, hey, look, we're looking for some fresh. We're looking for some people that want to get involved. And I'm not, this is not, I'm not trying to relate this. Well, we're looking for people who want to get involved in the VBS. Or we're, we're looking for people that want to get involved in, in this ministry over here. And here's what we need. We need people to get in and get plugged in. So that why? So that we can make sure that everything gets accomplished that God's trying to do in our church. It's been, it's been amazing, even just, I feel like over these past three weeks. Someone said this to me today, I don't even know who said it. Someone said to me today, I feel like God is leading us from week to week. I thought that was so good. That was Brother Rick said that to me. God is leading us by week to week. And you know what I'm seeing by week to week? God is putting leaders and people in positions. And he's got something for our church. And so here is Solomon with all of this wisdom, he's sitting on the throne, he's looking out at Israel, and here's what they're thinking, what are you going to do? Man, how are you going to get your hands on all this? And he says, well, Azariah, Benaiah, and all these other names, we're going to stretch it out, and we're going to get the work done. I'm thankful for the Azariahs of the past. I'm thankful for the Zadoks of the past that are still in the present. And I'm praying that you'll stay in and keep going. I know we've got some Benias. You're like, I kind of feel like that. I kind of feel like I've been here since the beginning. Well, we need you to stay all the way through this thing. Amen. But we also need to add some new leadership, some new vision, some new people. Amen. Let's work together Amen. so that the Lighthouse Baptist Church can eat and drink and be merry for the Lord. Father, we love you tonight. We're so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for Lighthouse what you've done here and how you've gotten us through and we're feeble and we're frail 
And Father, we have made mistakes and we have faltered and done things, but you've got us through. You've blessed and you've done mighty things. I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom in leadership and structure. I have things that I know you're looking to do in our church. New people coming up and rising up to take those mantles. I pray that as new people continue to come into the church, that they would become three to thrive people so that they could be used and they could be enlisted for your glory. Help us to be available. Help us to be in. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet. With every head bowed, every eye closed. As we stand to our feet tonight, the invitation is open. Let's respond to God however he's spoken. The invitation is open tonight.